Hey, Magnify listeners, did you hear that we started a book club last week? And it's not too late for you to join. Read along this month's pick, The Law of Love in Action, by former NFL and BYU quarterback Steve Young. This book is all about how to love in a more Christ-like way. You can pick up your copy now of The Law of Love in Action at Deseret Book and DeseretBook.com. It's linked in the show notes. And don't forget to head over to Instagram at Magnify Community where you can follow along, submit some questions, and we're going to wrap it all up next month with the Magnify Book Club episode where we will join in the discussion with some of the women of Magnify. Happy reading. And now on to the show. Have you ever heard of a monkey's trap? Well, actually, they catch monkeys by taking a gourd or a coconut and drilling a small hole in the top, just big enough to stick the monkey's fist in. And then they put something the monkey wants inside, like nuts or berries or something that they would like to eat. And the monkey would come and see the food that they want and stick their fist in. And then they can't get their hand out when they're making a fist. But the monkey will stay caught because... All they have to do is release that food, but they don't want to, and they hold on to that. Have you ever felt like that monkey before, reluctant to let go of something that you want or something that you desire, when we know that the Lord has bigger plans for us? So how can we put these things aside and trust in God's plan? Let's chat about that today. We are women who love God and want to use our influence for good. No matter how ordinary we may feel, we each have a powerful purpose in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our time to step forward, to love fiercely, to lead boldly, to live happily, to fill the world with His light. Let's do it together on the Magnify Podcast. Joining in today's discussion is Maria Eckersley. And Maria, I just want to know, have you ever felt like this monkey before? (laughs) Where I'm like holding tightly to something I know I don't really need? Yes, all the time. I feel like I've done that with situations like when we have to move somewhere and you're just kind of holding on to where you used to live and you really, you know, but you know, you're supposed to move on and do something different. Or I've had this in callings too, or, you know, like you just feel almost an ownership of that calling. And when you get released, you struggle to sort of let that go. One of my favorite callings, Jason, oh, yeah. was he got called to be the bishop. I had been in the um, the gospel doctrine teacher for like five years in a row. It was my very favorite calling ever. And within months of him being called to be the bishop, he released me. And I was so. Oh, and it was him. It was Who did him. It? it was him. And he felt like it was the right thing. But I was like, holy that I really struggled to like go. And my grumpiness towards him sort of <laughs> spilled over. But I really think it was one of those things where like he had other things for me to do, other places for me to teach. I just had to let that one go. But yeah, so I've done it tons. How about you, Catherine? Oh, I I think with so many things in my life, especially with my kids getting older, it's hard for me to let go. Yeah. <laughs> I want them home and and starting new phases. And and I even look at that with my seniors getting ready to graduate right now. And it's just hard for me to to let go. But I always rely on that promise that if I do, that there's something greater in store. Yeah. But I just have to be able to, to release the hand. And sometimes that can be more difficult than we think. And today we're going to talk about Elder Massimo DeFeo's talk. And what about his talk inspired you, especially with things that we need to let go of? Yeah. I just thought his, I think I'm always drawn to conference talks that bring scripture to my mind in a way I'd never seen before. And I'd read this story before, but I'd never seen it before. And I felt like he helped me just sort of open it up. And this idea of this beggar who, I mean, it's just this tiny little story, but he comes to the savior and he really wants sight. Like he's been blind. I don't know how long, but he wants sight. And so he calls out to the savior, calls him the son of David. And the savior sends his apostles or his servants, whoever they are to, to get him and to bring him close. And then there's this really cool moment where he sets down the beggar's coat and, and before the miracle. And that's the part that caught my eye. I was like, oh, he he voluntarily like let go of his old life in the hopes that this miracle could happen. And I feel like that's kind of that leap of faith that he wants all of us to do. I could see lots of times in scripture where 
that same pattern pops up where he's saying like, you're not, you're not going to see what's going to happen the same way. I don't know what he's going to put in my hand as soon as I pull it out of that box. He's just saying, just trust me, Maria, let that go. And something better will come. Um, and I just feel like that piece of scripture was all new to me. So I love the way he articulated it. Well, talk to me about the personal application of this principle of dropping the beggar's coat. Yeah, I think, well, I'll be honest, when this, when I heard this talk, the, the visual that came into my mind, because I've seen about like, what is my beggar's coat? What is it? When have I done this? And I had sort of a, a flash of memory come back as he was talking. It was a memory I hadn't had for a long time. But so in the middle of our six kids, we've got this five-year gap. There's a big, long gap. And that was not my plan. My plan was to have, you know, all my kids like two, two and a half years apart. I don't know how many exactly, but I knew that was sort of my plan. And after we had our third and I finally, got, I felt really prompted, like it was time to start again. It was time to get pregnant. And I was honestly, I was kind of resistant because I had three under like five and I wasn't sure how it was going to go. And I felt clear prompting. Yep. It's time. Jason felt prompting. And so I like took this leap and we decided to get pregnant. It was just this, and it was sweet. Everything happened and it was great. And then I, I, I wish I could this will make me feel like oversharing, but like I went and I spoke at a girl's camp the, the night before I had spoken all about faith and taking these leaps of faith. And I had just had this sweet experience. I'm like, yep, it's worth it, girls. And the next morning I miscarried and I, oh my gosh, Catherine, I just struggled. I was like, what, why, why, why did this happen this way? And I started to lose my trust a little bit. And it took me a while. It, it took a while for me to kind of regroup. And by the time I was able to let my grief go a little bit, I could tell what he was saying to me is like, Maria, I need you to let go of this feeling you have Bef before we can move forward in any way spiritually. You've got to let go of this distrust. And to me, it was like this beggar's coat. Like I really felt entitled to that grief. I felt entitled to that, um, you know, the, the feeling of not trusting the spirit very well. <laughs> and I felt justified in holding that beggar's coat. And I really could feel this push to set that down. And it really wasn't until I heard his talk that that memory came back and I was like, oh, that's what I had to do. And now I can see, I mean, we had three kids after that. We had, we've had some really incredible experiences, but at the time I didn't know any of that would happen. And so I've had some really poignant moments where you had to set down a beggar's coat <laughs> and it's hard and it takes time, but it's always worth it, right? What you pick up is always greater. But it's just trusting that there will be something to pick up, I think, yeah. is interesting. And and you mentioned that the placement of the story in the scriptures is really interesting to you and teaches you a great lesson. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I didn't. I just was studying. And I was like, wow, look, it's right in the same chapter as the rich young ruler. So you know how we all know that story about he's invited, he's this wealthy guy, and he's kept the commandments all his life. And he comes to the Lord and he says, you know, what more do I need to do? And the Lord asked him to give away all of his possessions and follow him. And what occurred to me as I was reading Elder Feo's talks, I'm like, oh, these, both of these men are asked to set down their beggar's coat, but only one of them does. The rich young ruler has a very lavish, fancy coat. It's not a beggar's coat in the same way, but it's something he can't let go of. And because he doesn't let go of it, he doesn't get to follow the savior. You know, he doesn't get to see what would have happened next. We know from Bartimaeus's story that he follows from that day forward and that doesn't happen for the rich young ruler, as far as we know. And so I just think you have to embrace the vulnerability that comes in that moment. I think we're all, I can picture Bartimaeus in that moment. I can channel his brain. And I think the scariness of setting down the only possession that I have, the only thing that, and it's probably the link towards him having any kind of income. It's his, it's what holds him in his current life. And to have the vulnerability to say, I'm going to set all of that down on the hope that something else is going to happen. I really think his steps toward the Savior in that moment are just as scary as Peter's steps onto the water. Because you know, Peter at least had a lot of experience with the Savior and he knew the Savior could do miracles and he'd seen them with his own eyes. Bartimaeus is like, probably just heard it from somebody somewhere, but he has the guts in that moment to set down his coat and step forward. And that's like stepping on the water. You know, it's to me, that's given the, his amount of light and knowledge, I just thought that was remarkable. So I think we're supposed to take those leaps. I think we have to take those leaps. You can't grow faith that he wants you to have without those big leaps. Yeah. Well, I think like he set down that beggar's coat, but 
you had to set down anger. You had to set down hurt. I think a lot of us have to set down resentment or insecurity. So how did you find the courage to set that down? I, I wish I could point to like a certain day or some revelatory experience. It wasn't like that for me. I could just feel that I was plateauing. You know, like I really could feel that I wasn't making any headway. I was still active. I was still faithful. I was still fulfilling my callings, but I didn't feel that like, you know how sometimes you get this surge of, oh, I just did something hard and I've just accomplished something. And there's this like joy that comes from that surge. I hadn't felt that in a long time. And it got to be like two years where I was just going through the motions and I felt so stagnant. And at a certain point, I was just like, I, d I don't want this anymore. And it, I just needed to make that change. And it took a bit of a leap. But honestly, I think it's the same thing that motivated Bartimaeus. You know, I think he called to the Savior and it was the apostles or the servants who came to him and said, no, you can trust the Savior. Come, he's calling you, arise. And so Bartimaeus goes and he follows him. I think it's the same thing that probably happened with me. I can't point to like a certain talk I heard or tell you a quote that I read. But I, when you listen to the words of the prophets, you listen to the apostles and they tell you, Yes, life is hard and come, arise. He's calling you like step away from stagnant life. And so for me, that's that always makes a difference. And every six months when we hear it, I feel this like surge of, okay, yes, I can do this again. We can do this. Well, sometimes I think of that story. Bartimaeus believed in the Savior. Peter had experiences with the Savior when the Savior called to him to step out of the boat. And I think in order for us to find that courage, sometimes we have to have a relationship where we have to know the savior in order to find that courage, to take that leap, to let go, to let go of our anger or our frustration or whatever that is. And I think everybody listening is going to feel something about what they're holding on to that's yeah. keeping them from seeing his full light. And I think that's the, that's the call. That's yeah. the call of the disciple is to arise and to let it go. Yeah. Well, and like, um, you know, Sister Craig's talk that we all love that it was all about, you know, that setting, what do you need to set down today? And what do I need to pick up today? I feel like that's kind of those kind of prayers for me, they get answered really fast. I might doubt my ability to receive revelation on everything else. But if I pray and say, what's my beggar's coat? What am I holding that I need to set down? Those mm -hmm. answers come pretty fast <laughs> because he doesn't want you to live like this anymore. He can see you with your hand in the box and he's like, Maria, <laughs> there is so much better over here. Just set it down. And Maria, maybe that's that first step of taking courage that we need to take is asking, Yeah, the what is down. my bigger's coat? Yeah. That's a courageous prayer for me. As long as you're willing to do it's it. It's like when I pray for patience. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily <laughs> the answers that I want. That's okay. Well, I know you have another takeaway that where you talk about seeking the source of inner light. Yeah. Tell me more about that. This was prompted by his story about getting the eye inject injection. So at the beginning of his talks, he was talking about how he's just walking down the street one day and all of a sudden his eyes go kind of blurry and dark and he's afraid. And so he goes to a doctor and he finds out he has to get these routine injections. I think he said every month right into his eye in order to keep his sight. And then his question was like, do, I, do my, does my spiritual sight have similar issues? Like, and it was something about the way he phrased it that I really loved. It was this invitation to like self-examine and say, Am I seeing things darkly? Because sometimes I think you look in the world around you. Like I don't know about you, Catherine, but social media has been rough lately where I just feel like there's some heated comments and there's some animosity that I just can't take it. And the world feels dark. And what I found yeah. is if I just like turn in instead of expecting the world to get brighter, you can find light and hope in you. Like you can find a source of strength and hope within rather than expecting the world to change around you almost the same way like you know my kids don't know what it's like to not have a flashlight on them at all times but like when I was a kid I remember using my Timex watch to try and light up my bedroom you know like the little button on the side of my watch but they have a light all the time and they never know what it's like to be in the dark because they have their phones everywhere and I just feel like that's kind of his invitation he's like there is actual light at your fingertips if you come to me first if you Focus on me first. In fact, that leads into the Bartimaeus story too, right? Because his whole point was Bartimaeus couldn't see the Savior. He could only hear him and he could focus on him and then he could work his way towards him. And I think that's his invitation is to find like some sort of inner light. How do we go about doing that? Well, I think for me, the biggest 
biggest way I found to do that is to study the life of Jesus Christ. Like in any book of scripture, it doesn't have to be like you go into the New Testament, but anytime you learn about the Savior, even through the lens of like modern revelation, listening to modern leaders, you start to feel brighter. Like I think his, the idea of like light cleaving to light, I think that happens when you study the life of the Savior. You get to know his character, you get to know his mercy and his plan for you, and you just feel solid. You know, there's something about the solidifying nature of Christ's character that just gives you like firm ground to stand on. Do you think that's what he means by having clear spiritual vision is that you're focused on the savior? What does that look like for you? Clear spiritual vision. I think for me, it it means I have to make this assumption that if things go dark, it's temporary. So almost like, you know how a couple weeks ago there was the solar eclipse and there's all this darkness that hits the world all at once and nobody assumed the world was going to stay that way. At least nobody I was talking to. Like we just assumed it was going to last for a second and then it'll pass. I feel like that's kind of how spiritual darkness hits me too. I'm always assuming that if the sun is blocked, meaning like the literal sun, if he's blocked, then there's something that's got to pass in front of me. And I there are certain things I can do to kind of speed up that process. But I should never assume that he actually is darker or that he's not connecting with me or that he's withdrawn. Yeah, no, he doesn't do that. That's not his nature. So like I had an experience when somebody who I love and really looked up to left the church and I I was in my early thirties at the time, but it kind of rocked me a little bit because I just didn't know how to process that. And I thought all of a sudden things that seemed so clear before started to look really dark. And I think that same, like I, I, so my husband's name is Jason and I can remember going to Jason after this person I loved left the church. And I, I assumed that he would be on board with this. And I said, Jason, I just don't think we should go to church anymore until I feel differently. Like I'm, I was that thrown. And he, I thought he would say, great. <laughs> like I thought he'd be like, okay, just take the time you need and we'll sleep in. But instead he like said, no, he was like, Maria, you're never going to find truth this way. I'll help you study. I'll get you to the temple with you. Like I'll come to church with you. You're never going to find truth this way. And it kind of, reset me a little bit where I was like, oh, oh, I do know this stuff, you know? And so we, I worked and that's really where I started to get into scripture study and really understand my scriptures. Cause I didn't ever want to feel that vulnerable again, where my testimony could just be blown off by one person's opinions on something. And so I really started to dig into my scriptures and get to know it. But, but I think that's kind of what he's inviting you to do. He's saying like, if the world gets dark, trust that you can do something. You can go to the right doctor. He'll give you the prescription. And if you keep it, you'll get your sight back again. You can see clearly if you follow his course. So that's my goal. And Maria, I think it's important to note that it's not if the world gets dark, but when. Yeah, honestly, yeah. Like in in his talk, it didn't phase him. He didn't start self-doubting when he lost his vision or you were just explaining when the world's gotten dark for you, you have to trust and have faith in that, that he is still there. Yeah. And I, I just want to ask you, so in those moments of dark, what do you hold on to? How do you know that you can trust him? I don't know that I can always when it's really dark, but what I found is that the more I experience the light, the more peace I feel. I think the same way Elder DeFeo, the reason he didn't freak out and think the world was getting darker is because he'd had so many years of light, right? He'd, he'd experienced light for himself for years and years and years. So when it went dark that day, he was like, oh, it must be me. There, something's wrong with my vision. And I feel like that's sort of why we need daily discipleship. He wants you in your scriptures every day and in prayer every day and serving your callings and all of those things so that you experience light on a regular basis. And you notice when things get dark and you know, oh, wait, something's wrong. I think I need to boost something. Those spiritual injections for me are like, I increased my temple attendance this year because I could feel things weren't as light as they used to be. And I was too busy and too tired all the time. And that's honestly what kept me out of the temple last year. I was like, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. There isn't enough time. And this year I was like, I think that's an injection I need. Like I need a, a booster to my site. And so I decided to make time. My schedule is no less busy. I am I, it's exactly the same, but I've got more light. And so I feel like I can navigate my world better, even though my world isn't easier. Does that make sense? Do you have that, Catherine? Does that make sense? Yeah. And and I think part of it is also trusting that I have received the light, that I have received answers. 
and that I can move forward even if I'm not feeling it in the moment. And that goes to your next point when you say that we have already been healed. Yeah. Oh, I loved this. Tell me why you loved this. Oh, well, because I've always envied people like Bartimaeus. I'm like, if I was someone who had been healed by Jesus, then for sure I would follow him. You know, like I, if I was someone who saw the daughter of Jairus stand up off her bed, then I believe I would be like, yes, I'm in your camp. I'm, I'm here always. And I know myself and I don't, I'm not unshaken. You know, I'm not there, but I've always envied the people in the New Testament because I'm like, wow, how could you walk away from that? And then the more I studied, especially going into his words in a little more, like with a fine tooth comb, I found myself thinking, look what he testifies of. Like if you look in Elder DeFeo's talk, he basically says like, who am I to say if I've got great spiritual sight, but let me tell you some things I can see. And then he testifies of what he can see. So he says things like, I can clearly see the hand of the Lord in this sacred work and in my life. I see the faith of many wherever I go who strengthen my own faith. I see angels all around me. Like he lists seven or eight things he can clearly see. And so to me, I was like, oh, maybe... Maybe I actually have already experienced the Savior's miracles. Like, what things in my life can I see now that were dark before? And I started to think and actually write down in the margins, what can I see? So, for example, I used to dread Isaiah. I used to be scared of the book of Revelations. I never would have chosen to study those books. And now because of the different callings and different work that he's had me do, I see light in those verses. Where I was blind, now I can see. Not perfectly. I'm sure there's work to be done, but you know, like I can see, and there's something so sweet about that. Like all of us in these mini revelatory moments experience what it goes, what it's like to go from blindness to sight. That's an incredible thing. And the fact that it's not a one-time shot in your life, like Bartimaeus, it's all the time. Every time you receive revelation, he's trying to take you from blindness to sight. And that to me was like this, oh my gosh, I got miracles all over the place. I can testify that I have been healed by the Savior and I can expect more healings down the road. So I know healing, like you haven't had him place his hands on your eyes and heal your eyesight, but how have you felt healing from him? Just like added understanding. That's the biggest one for me. My biggest spiritual impressions come with like, you know, just a clarity of thought. And I can look at scriptures that I've looked at before and see new things, or I can look at a person who I've made assumptions about before and see new things. Can you give me an example of that? Yeah. Well, like I teach YSA, that's my calling is to teach this YSA class. And there it's people who come into the room who my immediate, like natural man assumption, I I automatically like think I know who they are and what they're, you know, what they're like. But because of, I think the setting apart that happened with that calling, as soon as they sit down in the seat, I swear, I don't even, I can't even articulate how it happens, but I can see how much God loves them. I, I can feel how much he loves them. No matter what's going on in their life, I can feel it. And I immediately want to like offer something. Like I want to wrap my arm around them. I want to know their name. I want to help them. That's not something I should be able to see. I don't have any right to see their spiritual state or what's going on. Well, I can, I can see it. And I just think there's to me, when I have those moments of clarity, I feel like he's he's really trying to open my eyes. He's trying to help me see like, Maria, you could get more of this, what you're feeling right now in this moment. You can get more, come closer, keep diligently studying, keep serving your callings. And then there will be more that comes your way. That's his promise. Well, I, I love how we talked about some of the blessings that can come into our life when we understand that we already have been healed. And some of the actions that we can take. So how do you apply this knowledge? Like, how can you apply this to the everyday life? I think his big message to me was stop waiting to be acted upon. You know, it's almost like you can hear Elder Bednar in his his words. He was like, Bardmaeus, what he did was he chose to act instead of wait to be acted upon. And he sort of pushed back against opposition. Like there were people who were trying to shush him. I'm sure there were people that were like, Jesus is too busy. You need to leave him alone. But he stood up and he was strong and he trusted in the words of the servants who came to get him. Like he followed people he didn't know and let them guide him toward the savior. So I feel like that's how you can apply it. Like you should be able to take the words that we heard in conference and follow them and trust that they're going to actually get you closer to the healing you actually need. And not little tiny healing in your life, but like miraculous 
sight giving healing if you follow the servants that he's trying to help, you know, position you in. And and then to be able to testify of the Savior, to be yeah. able to stand as as a witness and to do so, I think, more openly yeah. and more freely. And I think sometimes we shy away from that because we're hesitant or we don't want to offend people. But Maria, how can we stand as a witness of Jesus Christ or testify of him? In fact, I was just watching the masters. I don't know if oh, you yeah. followed the masters at all. So if you don't know, it's one of the world's most famous golf championships. Scotty Scheffler won the masters. And I've always kind of been a big, big Scotty fan anyway, but at the end of the masters, they interviewed him and there's this 37 second clip, which I now love him even more, but he said how much he hates losing. Anybody who is competitive knows how much they hate losing. But he said, my friend said me to, said to me this morning that my loss has already been paid for on the cross that my identity wow. has been paid for on the cross, that win or lose, it won't change. Well, no. And I thought, well, look at this platform that he has to testify of the Savior. And we don't have necessarily a platform like that, but how can we be more freely open about how we feel about the Savior? I, well, I think it's even these little things. Actually, some of my favorite testimonies are those little ones, you know, like you just hear someone talk about where they struggled and how they overcame it, how they how they got through their adversity rather than just like trusting that there is help at the end. So I just sort of think even if you just say to yourself, OK, this week I'm going to testify to somebody about a beggar's coat I set down and the joy I found because I put it down or I'm going to testify to somebody about a time when I felt darkness and now I feel like even if it's not like complete darkness to complete light, just like anywhere on that spectrum, I feel like those little testimonies of what you know is good about the gospel are just as powerful. It doesn't have to be what I know is true. Some of us struggle to know exactly what is true because we don't feel like we know enough. Right. But I think we can always testify about what is good. You know, what is good? So if a neighbor comes up to me and says, I don't understand why you go to that temple. Tell me more about why you go to that temple. I think you can easily say things like, you know, I can't really explain it all. It's hard for me to wrap my head around it, but I feel so good. You know, when I go and I come back, I feel good and I feel strong again. So that I usually call that the gateway of good. It's like, just focus on the good of things. If you're going to stand up and bear testimony in sacrament meeting, it doesn't have to be everything you perfectly know. Just say what is good or where you find hope or where you see light that you didn't see it before. That's just as powerful of a testimony to me as saying, here's what I know to be true. I think, in fact, in some ways it's better because you give people the tools they need to figure out how to get where you are, right? That's what the Savior's message is all about. I love that. I always say that there's like a spectrum of testimony and saying, I hope is just as powerful as saying, I know. Yeah. Well, it's and all a more. <laughs> And I love that testify about what is good. Yeah. Or where you find hope, you know, like I just think, ah. I think hope is infectious. So when you hear someone say like, I don't know this for certain, but oh my gosh, I really hope it's true. You know, or I, I can't tell you this is perfectly accurate, but man, I feel this hope when I read this or when I heard this talk and that's infectious. Cause then I feel like I can act on their words. Whereas saying something I definitively know is true can almost push me away to some degree. Cause I immediately start to feel smaller. Like, oh, I don't know what you know, and I don't know how you know it. So now I just feel inadequate. So I feel like if we open it that gateway to good, it's this invitation to say, come join me. You know, like, I'm just on this path. I'm just figuring this out. Come with me and let's let's cruise through this gateway of good and find what's on the other side. I think it's welcoming. And for me, maybe that's the beggar's coat that I need to lay down, that I don't have to know. I don't have to have a perfect knowledge and I can share what is good. Like let go of my insecurity and, and let go of my doubt yeah, and focus on what is good. It's so good. I don't think it's wrong to know some things. Just for, like, I think there are certain things I know. Like I know God loves me. I can't explain how yeah. or why even. I can't, but I know that. So I don't think it's off-putting to have a certainty. I just don't think we should only have certainty or that we should wait to talk until we have certainty. When everyone else in that crowd saw Bartimaeus put down his coat, they also hoped, right? They leaned in and uh -huh. were like, I got to see what happens. And I think 
we need a little bit of that. All of us are working towards the next thing we want to know. So we should be articulating, here I am in this process. I know this so far, but let me tell you what I'm working on. You know, I, I just think that's hopeful. And and I think hope is not being subject to our circumstances. Yeah. That sure. we have hope that we can take control and, and rise. Yeah. So Maria... I have loved this conversation and there's so much to take away, but what would be your small and simple challenge for us this week to focus on the savior and lay down our beggar's coat? Yeah, I think I, I started to write down on my margins. I have a hashtag be like Bartimaeus now. So I'm like, maybe that should be my anthem for this week. Like, I just want to be like him. I want to be someone who's very aware of what my weaknesses are and who knows the source of hope and who works my way towards it. I listen to the the prophets and the apostles who are trying to guide me towards him. Like all of those things are how you can be like Bartimaeus. But I think sometimes first, I think we, we should have like our goal is to just know what our beggar's coat is. We probably have a bunch, but I think you can pray directly to the father and say, help me see what I'm holding that I'm missing out on some of life because I can't let this go. And it might be a grudge you have. It might be pain from the past. It, who knows? But he'll tell you. And so my thought was like, what if we just have a post-it and we just stick it on our end table that as we pray, like, help me know my beggar's coat. And as soon as you know it, you just write it down. And then I don't think you should expect that you can set that down immediately. The only reason that Bartimaeus could set it down is because he trusted in the Savior. He'd heard stories about him. He hoped. So I feel like then you have to start praying for like, what's the goodness that could flow into my life if I set this down? And then just start to listen. Like, what will you, what goodness are you missing out on because you're holding this? And then write those down on the post-it note. And then over the course of time, when you've got enough evidence in your life from the spirit that this is worth it, I think you'll naturally set it down. It's just, it's going to be a process. But I think, what if we just are proactive like Bard Mace and figure this out? I love that challenge. It's something that I can do. And it's also going to take courage to ask what my beggar's coat is. Yeah. So to have the courage of Bartimaeus and he will answer. And I would have a tendency to put a lot of post-it notes on my end table. Same. <laughs> but <laughs> I like the just starting with one. Yeah. I think, and you'll get momentum, right? That was conference too. You'll get some spiritual momentum as you set one down and you realize, oh yeah, my life is better. Or I just feel more connected. Even if your life isn't better, feel closer to God. And then life is better, right? It's just measured differently. Maria, you just have a way of inspiring me with understanding and knowledge to look for the light and to be better. Same to you, Catherine. That was a really powerful, small and simple challenge by Maria. And I would love to connect on social media so that we can support one another in trying to let go of our beggar's coat. So head on over to at Magnify Community and let's connect on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here.